Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Let's turn into to our Bibles to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 2, where we left off last week. I once worked with a church that was struggling to find its identity, I suppose. They were a fragmented group, and they had so many different little ministries that met on different days and weeks or and nights of the week. And uh, these groups didn't really communicate much with each other. It was basically... Um, a community center that had several little churches that met within it, but didn't really communicate with each other. And they were trying to find out why they weren't growing as a church and why they were so divided. And so they brought in an outside consulting firm. I think they paid um, way too much money for it, but. Uh, the consulting firm came in and looked at something pretty obvious. They said, you know, it's sort of like a family. Uh, you guys, instead of sharing your meals together, it's like it's dinner time and you've got your teenagers up locked in their room. You've got mom in the sewing room, dad in the TV room. They're not with each other. They're eating their own meal privately at dinner time instead of meeting together at the dinner table, having conversation, and enjoying a common experience. He said that, they said, that is your church. That's what this church has become. And we recommend, for health's sake, uh, that you have family meals together, have a weekly Bible study where all of the church meets uh, to dig into the Word. I, I thought, well, that's, that's insightful. I don't think you need an outside consulting group to be paid to figure that out since that's what this says. But I guess if you don't read that book that much, then you need somebody to tell you it's in there. But they did, and they said you need to go through and have a common meal. There's nothing like a, a church that meets regularly uh, to enjoy common meals in the, in the scriptures. This church is healthy because uh, people like you that are devoted to the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer, you make it a priority uh, to gather together and to uh, come together. You could watch it online. We're glad those of you who are watching online, whether you're in Stockholm, Sweden, or, or wherever else, we're glad you are. But um, at the same time, everyone online and offline needs to be with a family sharing a common scriptural activity like this. Uh, there's nothing like that for your personal growth, but also for our growth as a community. So I applaud you for doing that. And, and our common meal tonight is in 2 Samuel chapter 2. Now, let's ramp up to where we left off. We left off right about in the middle of chapter 2. We're going to pick it up a little bit before the middle. Uh, where, where we left off, we made it down to verse 11. We're going to pick it up in chapter 2, verse 12. But let me jog your memory and take you back to when David, whom really this is about, David and his life, David who will become King David, when David was just a kid, the prophet Samuel came to his house. He was out watching sheep. He was just a kid working the farm. He was, I don't know, in FFA, I guess, in high school, and he was out watching the sheep. So. When the prophet Samuel uh, came to the house of Jesse and had the kids line up, you know the story, eventually David was brought in, and he was anointed as the king of Israel, even though there was a king at the time named Saul, he was anointed as the next king. He was probably around 15 years of age, between 14 and 16 years of age when that anointing took place because 
it's not for another about 15 years that he actually enjoys the title as the king, when he becomes the king. So he is anointed privately as a teenager, a young teenager, but when he's 30 years of age, he begins to reign in Judah, and it won't be till he's 37 years of age that he's going to reign as the king of all of Israel, all 12 tribes. So God anointed him, God called him, God gifted him, but he didn't step into that for over a decade, even two decades before he fully realized being the king over the entire nation. That's a long time to wait. I think of Paul the Apostle, called by God as one who would bear his name before the Gentiles, before the Jewish nation, and before kings. But that man, Paul, who was still Saul of Tarsus, wasn't ready yet. Called by God, gifted by God, but not released at that time for quite some time. He went down to Arabia, went back to Tarsus, eventually was called by Barnabas. It could be uh, several, it was several years before he was released into ministry, at least eight years. So some of you are waiting on the Lord for something. You feel strongly that he's gifted you, called you, enabled you. But you kind of look up at the sky every now and then and go, what? When? You're still waiting. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles, but, but wait on the Lord and wait for his timing. And David is like that. David reminds me of the son of David who will come, Jesus Christ, the greater son of David. God the Father has promised him a kingdom. But Jesus himself said, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels, not even the Son, but only my Father who is in heaven. And when the disciples came to him later on, before his ascension, and said, they said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Is now the time when you're going to rule and reign? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which my Father has put in his own authority. So even Jesus was willing to wait on God the Father's timing. David, the prototype of that, is waiting for the kingdom, waiting for the right time. He doesn't assume, he doesn't push, he didn't take Saul down when he could have. He doesn't rejoice when Saul dies, he is waiting for God's timing. So we sort of left off discussing that because now we're going to see him ascend to the throne. If you wanted to title chapter one something, you might call it crying for the king because David laments for the recently slain king, King Saul. So it's crying for or crying over the king. In chapter two, you could have put a title over that, coronation of the king. That is the new king, that is King David when he uh, becomes king and is identified as such, the next one. But then the second part of chapter two on into chapter three and chapter four is conflict with the king's house. That is the previous king, King Saul. David will have conflict because there's a rift that is developing between the descendants of Saul in the north and David and his house in the south. What's interesting is that neither the king in the north, a guy by the name of Ish-bosheth, one of the sons of Saul, the fourth son of Saul, he was obviously not in the battle that killed his three older brothers and dad. So Ishbosheth is the king. He's not a warrior. He wasn't on the battlefield. But his commander-in-chief was a guy by the name of Abner. Do you remember Abner? Abner was the commander-in-chief or the chief general for the army of Saul. Saul is dead, so now he maintains being the commander over Ishbosheth's kingdom in the north. 
David's chief of staff or chief general is a guy by the name of Joab. Neither David or Ishbosheth are trying to push their way into the throne, but those two commanders, his, their staff members, are the ones that stir things up, and that's where we come to chapter 2, verse 12. Now Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim, that's the headquarters for the northern tribes at this time, east of the Jordan River, and they went to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, I'll get to that name in a little bit, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. So they sat down, one on one side of the pool, the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and compete before us. Before us. And Joab said, let them arise. They go down to Gibeon. Gibeon was a little town, an enclave, about seven miles north of Jerusalem. You can visit that area today, though it is under Palestinian control. It's under the Arab name El Jib. El Jib sounds a little bit like Gib, Gibeon, and it's related to that name. And they have discovered, archaeologists have found, the remains of a large pool. And the pool is about 40 feet across, 35 feet deep. It's a large cylinder made out of different stones and a circular staircase from the top to the bottom, 97 steps from the top 35 feet down, capable of holding an enormous amount of water in that pool. If you go down that staircase and get to the bottom of that pool, you go into a water shaft with steps another 45 feet down uh, where the water table is and they evidently brought water in to fill up the pool, not as a community swimming pool. It wasn't like they're out hanging out by the pool under the umbrella sipping their Diet Cokes. The idea is that this was a water feature for irrigation in those days. But you can visit the pool today. So they come down to Gibeon, the northern tribes under Abner says, let's go down, man. Let's go down into David's territory. And Abner challenges Joab. You take some of your men, I'll take some of my men, and, and let them compete. The idea is winner takes all. Whoever wins the battle, 12 against 12, whoever wins, wins the war, which is an interesting concept. Um, and it's not without precedent. I mean, that's, isn't that exactly what Goliath said? He said, give me a man who can compete against me. If I win the one-on-one, -on -one, then uh, Israel will be the Philistine servants. If your man wins and beats me, then we're all the Philistines are going to be your servants. So they acted as a federal head or as a representative in battle. And I've often thought that might be a better way to solve disputes. Instead of sending young men out, and I thank God for our military, I really do. We have the best military in the world, but a lot of times it's the politicians who get us into these troubles and into the wars. And, um, and so uh, the politician decides, well, we're going to have a war, so you kids get out there and fight. It's like, wait a minute, you, you called for the war, why don't you fight? You know, like David and Goliath. Uh, now, I wouldn't suggest that we employ that uh, currently uh, with our <laughs> current political situation because, uh, well, we'd be in trouble. So, but, but in concept, it's interesting. And here is the concept that Abner came up with. Let's have some representatives, 12 on 12, and whoever wins, wins it. That's sort of the idea uh, behind this. Let them compete. So Joab said, come on, let them arise. So they arose and went by number, 12 from Benjamin, followers of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, 12 from the servants of David. Each one grasped 
his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, the place was called the field of sharp swords, which is in Gibeon. So the plan was a flop. It was a fiasco. Uh, each person killed the other person, so 24 down and no resolution. So, verse 17, there was a fierce battle that day, and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. Now, the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab and Abishai and Asael. And Asahel was as fleet of foot, or as fast, as a wild gazelle. Now just let me tell you about Zeruiah. Zeruiah is not the name of a man, it's the name of a woman. Happens to be David's sister. David's sister was named Zeruiah. She had three sons. She is mentioned, Zeruiah is mentioned 26 times in the Bible and always alone, never with a husband. Her husband is not mentioned. We don't know why. Perhaps he died young. That would often be the case in those days. Or it could be that she was just a notable woman. And she raised three warriors, three mighty warriors, three uh, notable warriors that are, are, are kept in the archives, the annals, of, of Israeli history, but um, they're known as sons of Zeruiah. David himself will mockingly from time to time refer to them as, instead of by name, it's just, oh, you sons of Zeruiah, like, you guys are fierce. And so they're all, they're all mentioned here. Uh, interesting that one of them happens to be a good runner and is called uh, one who is as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. Now, Josephus, and you know, you'll hear me quote Josephus over the years, right? You know that he was a Jewish historian, but he was hired by the Romans, so his record isn't always considered accurate. G good historians, you know, tongue-in-cheek take what Josephus says. Some of it seems to be very accurate. Some of it seems to be a stretch. One of the places it's a stretch is his comments on Azael. Josephus says he was so fast he could outrun a horse. Now, I don't believe that, unless the horse was lame. Because a horse can run 25 to 30 miles an hour. In some cases, at full gallop, a good racehorse can get up to 50, 55 miles an hour. So I, I, don't, I don't picture this guy doing that. But it was perhaps a saying, like this is a saying here in the scripture, that he was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. So Azael pursued Abner in going. He did not turn to the right hand or to the left hand from following Abner. So the battle was a bust. Abner sort of on the run. The general's on the run. Azael, the son of Zeruiah, this warrior kid who's an athlete, runner, Olympic-style runner, is chasing him down. And Abner looked behind him and said, are you Azael? And he said, I am. And Abner said to him, turn aside to your right hand or to your left and lay hold on one of the young men and take his armor for yourself. But Azael would not turn from following him. So Abner said again to Azael, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I face your brother Joab? Abner does have a good point. Abner's point is that if I kill you, if we have a fight and I kill you, it could start a blood feud for generations. In those days, blood feuds were quite common. The Avenger of Blood was the official title in a family who was designated to go chase down the person who killed somebody in your family. But then if you killed somebody in that family, and the person who did it was the Avenger of Blood, that family will select its own um, Avenger of Blood and get somebody in your family, and then somebody in your family will get somebody else to get somebody in their family, and it's like, you know, it's like the Mafia all over again. It goes on for generations. That's the point that Abner has. Also, Abner is saying, look, 
instead of chasing me, get one of my soldiers and go kill him and take his armor. The point being, it was considered quite a feat if you could strike down a general and as a trophy, take his armor for yourself. That's what he was trying to do, it seems, is I'm gonna kill the general of this coup army that is coming against us. They started the fight. If I kill him and take his armor, it's gonna be considered a great trophy. But the general says, I wouldn't do that if I were you. You may wanna kill one of the old, other soldiers who, who I have on my flank. However, he refused, verse 23, to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear so that the spear came out of his back and he fell down and died on the spot. Where Asael, um, uh, on the spot. So it was that many as came to the place where Asael uh, fell down and died stood still. Like, wow, check that out. Gnarly. Joab and Abishai also pursuing Abner. And the sun was going down when they came to the hill of Ama, which is before Giah, uh, by the road to the wilderness of Gibeon. Now, I am okay with place names in the Bible. I have a relative understanding of Hebrew but I don't always get it right, and, and, and I will often pronounce them according to an anglicized version, and, and sometimes I'll make a mispronunciation, so I'm gonna give it my best shot. It sort of reminds me when I came to New Mexico, and um, I did not know the names. And it, we had started our church, and we, we were in our, one of our first buildings, and I wanted to tell a story about me going up to this lake north of us. I said, I, I've been up to Cochiti Lake. <laughs> and that's what people did. They laughed because that's not how you pronounce the lake. But this Californian calling it, it's got to be Cochiti. And it wasn't. It's Cochiti, right? That's the... Uh, authentic pronunciation, but what if I was talking to one of my assistant pastors who used to call uh, Hamas uh, Jamez and uh, got a lot of blowback. So uh, you, you find a lot of us doing that with biblical terms, right? So we'll give it our best shot. Now the children of Benjamin gathered together behind Abner and became a unit and took their stand on top of a hill. And then Abner called to Joab and said, shall your sword or shall the sword devour forever in this blood feud thing? Do you not know that it would be bitter in the latter end? How long would it be until you tell the people to return from pursuing their brethren? And Joab said, as God lives, unless you had spoken, surely thus by morning, all the people would have given up pursuing their brethren. So Joab blew a trumpet. All the people stood still, did not pursue Israel anymore, nor did they fight anymore. Then Abner and his men went on all that night through the plain and crossed over the Jordan and went through all Bethron and came to Mahanaim. See, I, I think I got that right. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing of David's David's servants, 19 men, and Asael. So 20 were down, 12 in that battle, and the rest died uh, in the pursuit. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin, that is one of the other 11 tribes, and Abner's men, 360 who died. So in relative terms, it was a wipeout. Then they took up Azael and buried him in his father's tomb, which is in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at daybreak. Now, I believe chapter 3, verse 1, ought to belong to the end of chapter 2 as a summary verse. So it says, now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Seven and a half years, there was really the first civil war 
in the nation of Israel, between north and south, a divided kingdom. It wasn't Ishbosheth that started it, it was his general Abner that started it. The general Joab down in the south defending David, and there's this rift that goes on seven years. But the north is getting weaker and weaker, the king is getting weaker and weaker, but the king down south is getting stronger and stronger, the house of David. And that verse, if you'll allow me, has spiritual truths and spiritual implications beyond the historic. When it comes to your flesh, when it comes to your spirit, and you know what the Bible says, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. One is getting weaker, one is getting stronger. When it comes to the appetites we have for this world, uh, is King Jesus getting stronger while King Self is getting weaker? Or is King Self getting stronger while King Jesus in your life is getting weaker and weaker? We all fight a battle. We may not like it, but we all do and we all know it. And one is getting weaker and one is getting stronger. And so there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. David grew stronger and stronger. The house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Now let me tell you what the writer is doing here in these chapters. He's showing us a pattern. Now we don't know who the writer is, by the way. Who's the author of the book of Samuel? There's been several suggestions. Samuel because his name's on it. Um, by this time, though, Samuel is dead, so he can't be writing posthumously. <laughs> he could have had a hand in writing 1 Samuel, so that's one of the guesses, that maybe Samuel wrote the narrative in 1 Samuel up to the point of his death. Another guess is that it was the prophet Gad, who is mentioned in relationship to King David. Um, and the other one is the prophet Nathan, who shows up rebuking David later on for his adultery with Bathsheba and killing of Uriah. Or it could be none of them, or it could be all of them together. We don't exactly know who wrote it, but whoever the author of this story is, he's showing us a pattern, I believe. And the pattern is this. David ascends to the throne of the southern kingdom of Judah only, and then later on, he ascends to the throne of all the 12 tribes of the nation, seven years later, in a very similar way. First, a rebel comes, a warrior comes with news of death. In chapter 1, it was an Amalekite. In chapter 3, uh, it is uh, Abner. Um, then um, the, the, the emissary that comes and makes the announcement gets executed, followed by a lament by the king. Uh, remember what uh, David did with hearing about Jonathan and, and, and Saul's death? He lamented over them, but he executed the one who gave him the news. Uh, we're going to find out that um, there's a couple of people that come from Benjamin and execute the king in the north, and they come with an announcement, and David hears about it, executes them, and then laments over Abner. So just as David rises to the throne of Judah at Hebron, he will also rise uh, following this very similar pattern, um, and the author seems to draw our attention to that. So that's just sort of a, a little bit of background. But I want you to notice in verse 1 something else, and then we'll move on. And that's the phrase, the house of David. In all fairness, you need to know this. For years, archaeologists and the academic community dissed the Bible because... It says the house of David in the Bible, but there is or was no outside proof that David even existed. There, there was no record, there was no inscription at all. 
The Bible says there was a guy named David. The Bible says there was a house of David. The Bible says David was the king. But there's no outside reference in any archaeological find, in any uh, extant piece of evidence anywhere that David ever existed. So, and I love this, the academic community said, it's all fake. The Bible is filled with errors and contradictions, and you can't trust it. There was no David. And then, in 1993, an Israeli archaeologist named Avraham Burin was digging up north at a place called Dan, Tel Dan. Some of you have visited Tel Dan. If you've been with us to Israel, you have visited that. And you've stood at the gate of the ancient city. And as they were digging the gates of the ancient city of, of, of Dan, Tel Dan, that area, one of his staff members noticed this little, what looked like an engraving or pictograph on one of the stones of the wall. Didn't think anything of it, but they were about to call it a day, and they drew attention to it, and they cleaned it up. And what they discovered is that it was an inscription written by a Syrian king. It's dated from around 830 B.C., or the time we think David reigned. And it was an inscription that detailed a military assault of one of the Syrian kings against the, and it, it's written in the, the wall, the house of David. Now, all of those academics had to eat their words. And it became such a monumental find, a monumental dig, and you can, the people in Israel and the archaeological community was just beside themselves. It's incontrovertible proof that there was a house of David. Um, now, you and I don't need that proof because we believe this book. That is our proof. God said it, we believe it. But there are some people who, I know God said it, but how do you really know, that, you know, it could be. And so, you know, they have their little crutch, uh, this archeological dig from 1993, and okay, well, I guess he really did exist. We'll find something else to moan about, and, and they do. But I just wanted to throw that out because it mentions the house of David. Verse 2, sons were born to David in Hebron. Firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. Second, Kiliab by Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. The third, Absalom, the son of Ma'akah, the daughter of Talmi, king of Geshur. The fourth, Adonijah, the son of Hagi. The fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital. The sixth, Ithream, by David's wife, Eglah. And these were born to David in Hebron. So, interesting. David comes to Hebron with two women, two wives. Already he has broken God's law. According to the writings, the law, uh, the um, books of uh, Genesis, as well as uh, Numbers, etc., Deuteronomy, uh, the king was not to multiply wives to himself. He was to write a book of the law, and uh, David violated that by having not one, not two, but six. And if you do all the math, a total of eight wives, which will be a bad example to his son Solomon, who takes that into crazy proportions with 700 wives and 300 concubines. So this is one of the great things about the Bible. It tells you the truth of the history. It doesn't hide it. It doesn't gloss over uh, its heroes. It didn't say, oh, here's David. He was a perfect person. It says, here's David, a flagrant violator of God's law, but God used him anyway. So this, to me, is one of the authentications of the Bible as the Word of God. It tells you the, the, tr the truth, the way things are. Uh, later on, it will tell us the way things should be. As we mentioned last week, the epistles will tell you how things should be. But this is historic narrative. This is how things are and were. This is what they did. It wasn't right. And it will cost David 
Uh, David's choices with his many wives will get him into trouble. There will be divided loyalties. Three of the sons mentioned here were problematic. Adonijah was one of them. He tried to usurp the throne. Amnon was another. He killed, uh, um, uh, his, he, he, he murdered. Um, Absalom uh, will um, be problematic in trying to take over the kingdom. And so, <laughs> in any family, there's sibling rivalry, but when you have many wives with many children, the sibling rivalry runs rampant, and it did, and it, it almost ruined uh, David and, and his legacy, and they became a grief to him. So um, what David is doing, let me just tell you what he's doing historically, it was typical for pagan kings to have several wives to cement ties between other tribes and other kingdoms. Practiced in Europe, in England, in Spain, in France, where you'd have a, um, a, a daughter of a king being given in marriage uh, to another king to form an alliance. As long as I married your daughter, you're not going to attack me, and I'm probably not going to attack you. So that, and and in, in ancient days, they did it with the multiplicity of women. Again, not God's law, not God's intention. God said, "My king is to be different," but David did it anyway. What do we learn from that? Well, we learn, first of all, let's not worship the heroes in the Bible, the men and women in the Bible. They're flawed. Second, it should encourage us because some of us get the mistaken notion that you have to be flawless for God to use. And that somehow we have this in our mind that God only uses perfect people. If God only used perfect people, then God would have no workers. No one could do anything because no one is perfect. So uh, uh, it's not an excuse to do what David did, but it should encourage you and I who have had our share of failures that God can use us, forgive us, reclaim us, and use us to be his worker. So it was, verse 6, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. Now watch this intrigue. This is the general. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aya. So Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone to my father's concubine? A word about concubines. Concubines were like wives with less rights. Women back in those days, wives even, had very few rights. Concubines had less. With, at least with a um, legitimate wife, you had to provide a writing of divorce. With a concubine, not so. Concubines were often used, if the wife couldn't produce the right heir, then you bring in another woman who could. That's the idea between Abraham and Sarah. I'm infertile, go to my handmaiden, which became his concubine, to bear a son. So that was not an uncommon practice, and concubines were part of a harem in the royal houses of antiquity, and they were considered the legal chattel, they were owned by the men, owned by the kings uh, in ancient times. To sleep with somebody's concubine like this meant you were making a move to seize the throne. This is why later on, when David dies, and the oldest son of David at the time, uh, Adonijah, uh, asked Solomon if he could have one of his father's concubines. Adonijah found that out and had him killed because that was making a move to seize the throne, to make a political statement. So uh, he, he was making his move for the throne. He was the general, but you get the idea that Ishbosheth was a very weak man, a very weak king. And, and you'll see it all, all throughout this narrative. So he wants 
Uh, he wants to be king. He wants to use Ishbosheth for a while, but he's really the power behind the throne. Ishbosheth is just a puppet of Abner. Then Abner um, became angry because King Ishbosheth, whom, by the way, it was Abner that set him up as king, made him the king, propped him up. Abner became angry at the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Now you and I <laughs> read that and go, okay, that's weird. Um, a dog's head that belongs to Judah? That would be like saying, do you think I'm a worthless nothing that is loyal to the house of Judah? Is that who you think I am? Today I will show loyalty to the house of Saul your father to his brothers and to his friends and have not delivered you into the hand of David and you charge me with a fault concerning this woman. Look, I'm the one who propped you up. I'm the one who gave you your throne, essentially. I was your dad's commander-in-chief. I've given the kingdom to you as your man, uh, your general. But now watch this. May God... Do so to Abner and more also, if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him. Now by this, I now understand that everybody sort of knew that David would be the next king, even his enemies, even those up north who were still holding on to Saul's kingdom. They knew it was David. It was the general feeling. Even Abner knew it. As the Lord has sworn to him, he knew he was God's anointed, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is up north. I mentioned Tel Dan a minute ago, the archaeological site. So Dan is furthest north. Beersheba is the city further south. So from top to bottom, the whole land, all of it, from Dan to Beersheba was a common saying to say the entire country. And he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. So Abner is out of options. Abner has killed Azael, so he has an enemy in Joab. But Abner has lost the confidence of King Ishbosheth because he had made an overt move for the throne by sleeping with a concubine, so, you know, the word's out on him, so he's out of options, so he's got to do something, so he's going to make a power play as the general to transfer the authority of the northern tribes, 11 northern tribes, down to David, so David would be the king over everything, and it's interesting also that he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him, so again, he's a king, but he's a puppet. He's um, spineless. He's not a warrior. He's not a leader. He's a palace boy. He was hanging around the palace. He's just sort of a, a, a career politician. I mean, just sort of raised in that environment, but never really had to do anything on his own and been protected by the household of Saul. And so he's really afraid of true leadership, true power. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David, saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. David, it's yours. You can have it all. I'm going to make sure you get it. And David said, Good. I'll make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face until you first bring me Michael perhaps better pronounced Michal, uh, the Hebrew pronunciation for his first wife. Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. So David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michael, whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Baharim weeping behind her, so Abner said to him, go return, and he returned. You remember how 
David got this woman? He mentions it here. David fought Goliath, David won. Saul wanted David dead because Saul was afraid of true leadership, true power like Ishbosheth. I uh, saw David rising in the ranks and the women singing the songs about him. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And it was a song everybody was singing, all the chicks were singing. It was on the top 40 charts. Drove Saul up a wall when they sang that song. So he thought, I've got to kill him. So he said, I know what I'll do. I'll, um, I'll say whoever goes and, and uh, kills uh, the Philistines and brings me back their foreskins. Weird story. Um, can have my daughter. So if you're a daughter, you get traded for a bunch of foreskins of the Philistines. It's, it's, just an, it's just so not right all the way around. So David does it. This girl becomes his wife. David puts her out to pasture. She never really loved David. Uh, and by this time, she has married somebody else. David demands that he gets her back. Now, we look at this and go, man, David, that's just so wrong. That's just so not right. Dude, you got six wives. And this gal's now happily married, it would seem, to this other guy because he's a crybaby when she goes and uh, is chasing her down the street. So it's like, dude, let it go. Let it go. Why would David do this? I'm not excusing it, but here's the political reason why he would do it. He wants to show that he still has ties to the house of Saul and that he is indeed the previous king's son-in-law. By having her in the entourage of women, it secures that from a political, worldly standpoint. Again, it's not pleasing the heart of God. It's just probably why he did it. So, her husband... That's why I say they probably loved each other. I'm sure she was weeping, but the author doesn't say she was weeping, just points to the fact that this husband was really bummed out and is weeping. So came up to a certain point, you know, he's following her along, and Abner finally said, now go get out of here, go return, go home. So he returned. Now Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel, saying, in time past, you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then, do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of all their enemies. You've heard me talk about Charles Spurgeon over the years, have you not? The British preacher, Victorian preacher in England, very, very famous, large church. Charles Haddon Spurgeon named one of his sermons by the title, Now Then Do It, based on this text. And here was Spurgeon's premise. He said, here you have the people of Israel for a long time thinking that they want to have David as their king, talking about having David as their king, maybe even planning one day having David as their king, but not having David as their king, not crowning him as their king. And he said, likewise, some of you, he says in his sermon, have thought about coming to Jesus as the king of your life, talked about coming to Jesus as the king of your life, everything but crowning Jesus as the king of your life. And his emphasis during the sermon is, now then, do it. And then, of course, Nike came along and stole the slogan in, in the uh, late 80s, right? That was their slogan with the whoosh, just do it. But this guy was the first. Now then, do it. And Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin. And Abner also went to speak in the hearing of David and Hebron. Question, why did he go and have to have a special message to Benjamin? To the tribe of Benjamin. Anybody know? King Saul was a Benjamite. Loyalties ran deep to the family of Saul among the Benjamites. Abner was a Benjamite. So he comes as a fellow Benjamite who are very loyal to the family of Saul because of all the tribes of Israel, the first king came from Benjamin. And so he has to have, give special persuasion to the 
Benjamite people. Abner uh, went to Benjamin, then he went down to David and Hebron, and it all seemed good to Israel, the whole house of Benjamin. Abner and 20 men with him came to David and Hebron. David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him, and Abner said to David, I will arise and go, gather all Israel to my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Here's the catch. David entertains Abner, the commander, the general of a rival army up to this point. His own commander, his own general, Joab, is absent when David entertains Abner, the rival. So when Joab comes back home and hears about it, his feathers are ruffled. At that moment, the servants of David and Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he sent him away and has gone in peace. David didn't kill him. Gave him a feast. Gave him falafels. And he has gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? So he's rebuking the king. Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away and he has already gone? Surely you realize that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you to know what is your going out and your coming in and to know all that you are doing. And when Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back from the well. Okay, pretty understandable that Joab hated Abner for two reasons, right? Number one, Abner killed his brother. So there's the blood feud. You killed my brother, I'm after you, number one. Number two, He's the rival commander, and he is probably thinking, my job's at stake. I'm about to be replaced by somebody else who occupied that position with far more experience before me, and that is Abner, who was not only Ishbosheth's commander, but Saul's commander. And David sort of was groomed under him. They have a long relationship. So I'm about to be replaced. So because of that, um, he's upset. So... Um, he brought him back from the well of Sirah, but David did not know it. When Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately, and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Azael, his brother. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, My kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab, and on all his father's house, let there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or is a leper or who leans on a staff, or that is somebody who is lame, or falls by the sword or who lacks bread. Whoa. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had killed their brother Asael at Gibeon in the battle. There's an important fact you need to know. Abner was killed at Hebron. Hebron, according to Numbers chapter 35, was a special city designated in Israel as a city of refuge, a place where you do not exact vengeance on a criminal, a place where a criminal can flee and run to and get a fair trial and get open-minded adjudication at the gate of the city. So he is killed in a city of refuge. Now, it says he told Abner to come to the gate. It could be that, you know, he, he, he killed him and then drug him right outside the gate. You know, it could have been one of those things that uh, technically, you know, um, he's outside the gate of the city, but hard to know how it happened. 
It does remind me of a story, though. There was a criminal who had done crimes in a certain state. The state police were after him, and they chased him, and they chased him, and they chased him, and they couldn't catch him, and they finally um, chased him all the way up to the state line, and the criminal made it over the state line and was standing on the other side in the opposite state, knowing that the state police in which he committed the crime couldn't do anything in old times when that was the case. There wasn't any kind of uh, communication so, um, or, or cooperation. So the uh, state police walked up to the state line, looked at the criminal, and said, you think you're pretty smart, don't you? The criminal said, yep, I do. You think you got away with a lot, don't you? Yeah, I kind of do. You kind of, I kind of feel good about myself. And the officer said, I got to admit it, you got me, you won. Put it here. The criminal said, okay, stuck out his hand to shake it, and the officer pulled him back into his state and arrested him. It could be one of those things that Joab did in, in, uh, in killing him, but the opposite may be killing him in the gate and then dragging him outside and, and trying to cover it up. I'm, I'm probably reading a little too much into the story, so I'll stop there. Then, verse 31, let's finish this uh, chapter up. Then David said uh, to Joab and to all the people who were with him, tear your clothes, gird yourself with sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. And notice this, King David followed the coffin. The first time you see King attached to David is here. First time he's called King David is now. And King David followed the coffin. So they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And Abner sang a lament over Abner and said, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put into fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. Strange epitaph. Should Abner die as a fool dies? What did he mean by that? Here's a possibility. If he would have stayed and not run away back home to Ishbosheth, but stayed in the city of refuge and appealed to me as the king, I would have made sure he would have at least gotten a fair trial. But because he didn't stay in the city of refuge and ask my mercy and be given according to the law of free trial, but he went out and then was called back, he died as a fool. So many people refuse to take Jesus as the refuge for their sin. Refuse to take refuge and hide in Jesus. They're, they hear the gospel, but they say no. And when they die, if, if the preacher was honest at the funeral, many of them are not, would have said of un, the unbeliever, he died as a fool. He got out of the city of refuge. It's a foolish way to go. Nobody here should die that way. So David's lament is, why did he have to die as a fool? He, he, you know, his, he wasn't bound and brought here for a trial. Uh, his feet was not put into fetters. He hadn't been found guilty. And you, as a man falls before the wicked men, so you fell. And all the people wept over him again. When all the people came to persuade David to eat food while it was day, David took an oath saying, God do so to me and more if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. Now all the people took note of it, and it pleased them, since whatever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's intent to kill Abner, the son of Ner. Then the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I am weak today, though anointed king, and these men, the sons of Zeruiah, are too harsh for me. The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. It was a good move on David's part. It was really, politically speaking, a public relations win for David. What David did with Abner would be called a media event in politics today. Media event meaning I'm going to make use of this to cement my kingdom for the people, in front of the people. So, for example, 
if we are involved in a war in a place that is questionable as to our foreign policy and a soldier dies and is brought back to the states, the president, any president, would honor the dead, which is genuine and fitting, but also, in doing so, uses the event to cement his policy of getting involved in such a war in the eyes of the people in the world. See how that works? That's really what David is doing. It was a smart move. Any king would and should do that. But his mourning is genuine, and, uh, and the people loved him for it. They realized this wasn't a coup. David didn't do this. He's above reproach. Somebody else did. And uh, what the author is doing is showing how David arrived at the place promised him by God as the king. Now he is the king. He's the king down south. By the end of the next chapter, he'll be the king of all the 12 tribes, and his kingdom continues to grow. Uh, so we have some great, great chapters coming up where uh, David will thrive, will expand the kingdom, will strengthen it. Um, so much of the promise that God gives that include Jesus is coming up uh, in the chapters we're going to get into. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, our ability to take uh, our week divided in two, gathered together in the middle of the week and pause and enjoy your word, instruction from your word. We are told by Paul that all of these things were written beforehand for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth have come. So all that is written in the Old Testament, these are examples to us, written beforehand to be examples for us. And some of the examples are good and should be followed, and some of them are bad, even with the heroes like David. But Father, we are so encouraged that even in our failures, in our coming short, you want to use us. So Father, forgive us, restore us, and use us for your glory. Use us in this city, in this state, in our world, to lift high the name of Jesus, to train people for ministry and for works of service. But use us, Father, in our sphere of influence, we pray in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's do that again. God's people said, Amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.